doing that. <laughs> I wish I could. Hello, everyone out there in podcast world. I hope you're having a wonderful day. You are listening to or watching the Service Business Mastery Podcast. I'm your, one of your hosts, Tersh Blissett, sitting virtually next to my co-host, Joshua Crouch. Today, we have Ryan England back on the show, and we're talking hiring. Ryan kind of found a pain point within his clients that he was working with his digital marketing and his marketing. That hiring was a really big pain point. And as we all know, and we mentioned in the last episode, if you haven't checked out the last episode, check that one out for sure. I'll link it in the show notes. But hiring is marketing. Like marketing, you have to market constantly to, to get hiring, to be hiring good, to be the gooderist at hiring. You, you have to be marketing that you're hiring constantly. Ryan found figured that out and really started focusing on that aspect in the business. And we're going to talk about several different things. Talk a little bit about core values and why they matter. Whether you're living the core values, you can just print them out and put them on a wall and not live the core values. Or for me, like people don't come here and see it printed out on my walls. Um, but we talk about core values a lot and we talk about our core values at the beginning of every single meeting. But if you don't live and die by the core values, then that's completely useless. We're also going to talk a little bit about these. I had to think about that for a second. Applicant it's not ATS. System. Yeah, it's ATS, but that's okay. <laughs> ATT, ATS, tomato, tomato, applicant tracking systems. And Brian, Ryan mentioned a little bit about that last episode and we got a lot of questions about that. So we want to bring him back on and talk about a little bit about that. Thecorematters.com is Ryan's website. So make sure if you have any questions, reach out to him there. Josh, you got anything well, to add to that? Yeah, Ryan said he may be getting, by the time you listen to this, the site may be new. So make sure you're really difficult on him and tell him everything that's wrong with his site. Yeah. Uh, we'll give you his email. You can send it to him personally. <laughs> exactly. But no, no, we did touch on applicant tracking systems last time, which it's a fancy term for a CRM for employees or pro prospective employees. It's a like a lead nurturing system where they come in, even if you don't hire them immediately, you stay in front of them and you have a bench. Yeah. And it's a super interesting topic because I think for the home service space, it's fairly new unless you're a really large company that maybe has some corporate money and they've shown you how to do some of this stuff. This is something I wasn't even, I didn't even realize existed. That's okay, Josh. Yeah. We all learned something new. You didn't know it existed either. Yeah, it is a really cool concept. One thing that, that Ryan did mention, though, is that it's not something that you're going to set it and forget it. You're not going to set it up like instantly and then just let it roll. It's something that you're going to have to pay attention to and mess with a lot. Also, excuse me if I ha if I sound weird today. I've had this kind of dry cough for the past couple of days and <laughs> I'm trying to get rid of it. But yeah, it happens summer colds. Yeah. With that being said, I'd like to get started with the show. Before we get started, we have to pay homage to our sponsors and the people, our partners who make this possible. Josh, you want to start us off with Sarah? Yeah. Sarah is a CRM program that really focuses on the things that matter in your business. It may not have all the bells and whistles of other CRMs, but it literally focuses on job time efficiency, automatic, automated dispatching, dashboards that give you the KPIs that are the most important to your business. Instead of loading you with a ton of data, they give you the data that matters so you can move your business. Sarah was one of our first sponsors and Billy is such a, such a great partner. He's constantly bringing super valuable nuggets to the show and stuff like that. We'll have a new episode coming out with him again shortly. Yep. But if you guys haven't checked it out, I would absolutely check it out. Just see what it's about. See how it can help your business. I'm not saying I'm just move and switch, but at least check it out. Yeah, hundred percent. And then I'll talk about company cam. Company cam is great because you are able to snapshot a photo, no matter what device you have. The challenge that I have with my guys is some of them have Androids and some of them have iPhones. <clears throat> and then you get that compressed photo being sent to me to my iPhone or to to Teams from a from an Android, and it's what potato did you use to upload this? And so, it, using Company Cam, it it keeps all the metadata and all that good jazz, and it can go across different platforms, and you can share a lot of photos with the client, or you can take some photos out and you can share a whole album with the client after you finish it, it finish the job. But 
Yeah, company cam is great. Can, and you can connect that to social platforms. You can do before and afters. <laughs> There's a lot of different things that you can do to help your marketing efforts too, which is uh, which is really cool. And connecting it to your website, the carousel on your homepage, you can do that too. But yeah, company cam is great. And I challenge you to to give them a shot, give them a shout and see see if they're a good fit for you. But yeah, with that being said, let's get started with today's show. Are you looking for valuable business advice to reach that seven-figure revenue mark? Do you want actionable tips to properly navigate through every business challenge you encounter along the way? Let Tersh Blissett and Josh Crouch be your guide in getting you to the top here at Service Business Mastery. Tune in as they sit down with world-renowned authors in business, leadership, and personal growth who share valuable insights about management, marketing, pricing, human resources, and so much more. Let their nuggets of wisdom gold guide you in owning a thriving, profitable, and ever-growing business. Here are your hosts, Tersh and Josh. Hey, Ryan, welcome to the show. Welcome back. Yeah, thanks for having me back. Awesome. We, we had a great time talking with you last time. You're a wealth of knowledge when it comes, especially this space where it's a never ending cycle of needing people and questions and concerns, especially with the latest where the economy, everyone's trying to predict where it's going to go and everyone thinks they know where it's going. Hopefully it doesn't go that way. But (laughs) that being said, we're always going to need people for our service businesses. It's never going to stop regardless of what happens with the economy. Even if it shrinks a little bit or expands, it doesn't matter. And I think we've learned that through before the pandemic, during the pandemic, we're always going to need good people. Yeah. And the struggle is finding them and attracting them. So that way we don't have to go and spend tens of thousands of dollars on all these different ad platforms to try to bring them in. Like, how do we get it where people are talking about us outside of outside of those ad platforms, like in their social circles and Facebook groups and stuff like that? How do we get them you talking know, about our company? Let me interject something really fast here and uh, give me your thoughts on this, Ryan. So <clears throat> I, I'm... I have a guy that's starting next week or uh, yeah, the next week. And it's the weirdest thing in the world because two months ago I was like, all right, I'm done hiring for the year. I've got my crew. I'm not going to hire anymore. And then one guy put in a a two day notice. I would almost call it a week notice, but it was like the Memorial day weekend or whatever it was. And he was like, yeah, Thursday, I'm going to be, it's going to be my last day. And I'm like, Oh, great. Okay. Now this is a guy that I nurtured all winter long. And I was like, like, drug him through and lost money on him and it's like whatever he moved back home but then all of a sudden two new people fell in my lap right after that and one guy that's going to be coming on at the next week or two i just thought he was gone because i've been talking to him for a month and a half two months now and it was one of those things where it was like we're just constantly having communication with each other and then all of a sudden he's like all right i put in my notice and i'll be there on this such and such date and i was like oh okay cool i thought that you weren't even doing that anymore because it was like he was so not wishy-washy but it was more of a like just the uncertainty there but we were still talking a lot but not necessarily about him coming on board with us he was he was asking lots of questions in general and i was just trying to answer them to the best of my ability um but i've never thought that i would hire anybody this time of year because typically Mm -hmm. i say if somebody's looking for a job this time of year it's because it's because they suck and for him i it was one of those things where he was frustrated because he's running maintenances all summer long and then mm-hmm. having to run service calls. And I was like, oh, I didn't really think about that. There's people that are just irritated with having to do certain things. And yeah. <clears throat> What's your thoughts on that kind of stuff? It's, I'll back up and I'll tell this. I run into a lot of people that look at res- resumes, for example. I know we don't get a lot of them in the trades, but when we yeah. do, we see people leaving and they're still a technician and they're bouncing from one company to the next, and they're like, I'm one company to the next. People are like, oh, I don't want those job hoppers. And I was like, I have to remember that from the employee's perspective, they have to really enjoy the work they go do. Yeah. Job hopping, it's because they're looking for a good place to work. It's not they're looking for figuring out what they want to be when they grow up. That's not the case. They know right. what they want to do. They just want to find the people they want to do it with. And I think that especially in the summertime, if you've got some marketing, some branding happening around recruiting, 
you can really find great people because what a lot of employers do right now in the trades is they burn their guys out. Everybody's short staff. That's a great point. They're working them crazy hours. The wife's at home saying, I'm tired of this. You need to find a new place to work. You're never home anymore. <clears throat> and they get to a point where like, I don't have time to look for something new. It's so stressful to look for a job. They don't have time to do it. But if they've got a relationship, they've been talking to somebody for a couple of months, they're like, this is where I'm going to go. It's almost yeah. no effort at that point. That's why it's so important to always be recruiting and always be thinking about this as a marketing activity. Because you never know when someone's going to hit that that breaking point and say, I'm done. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I think that's something that we forget because like Tersh said, that was the common theme that I always thought too. Do we really want someone in June or July? That's usually the guys we don't want. Yeah. But in the same regard, there is a shift. I actually talked to someone yesterday who last year completely went away from on call and he said he has not lost an employee since. And it was because they've started staggering shifts and they started doing these other things that have increased or enhanced their culture. Mm -hmm. It's enhanced the work-life balance. People don't hate coming into work anymore because it's like, hey, I know I'm going to be done by such and such time. And you know, anything after this time, we have someone else to take the calls. Yeah. And I, I do think that there it gets talked about a lot, but I think there's people that are scared to move into that because they've been doing on call for so long and it's just ingrained like what about mrs <laughs> mrs smith that calls at 10 o'clock at night like mm -hmm. how, how, we're not going to be able to get to her and it's, if you think about it from a perspective of revenue and options how many options do you think you're going to be able to give mrs smith at 10 p.m <laughs> do you think she's going to give two shits about your options at that point she's the cheapest option get me fixed I'll worry about everything else later. Or a technician which, yeah. providing options at that time. But it's in, in the, that, yeah, if they start providing options, the customers, they're going to get if, be pissed. If someone was doing what, that at 10 o'clock yeah. at night and I'm ready to go to bed, like, I just fix it. I don't care. How like, often care do you get that 10 o'clock call and it's truly an emergency? Right. That's the other thing. Well, like, it's an emergency. Can it down, but is it really an emergency? Uh -huh. I would say in Wisconsin, in a cold market like us, like air conditioning, obviously there's things you can do, fans and whatnot, but when it's really cold and your heat completely goes out, a fireplace isn't going to keep the house completely warm, especially with pipes. I would say there's probably two weeks a year in Wisconsin where it's like total emergency. <laughs> We're going to have to have all hands on deck because it's 10 below. So if your furnace yeah. goes out or your boiler goes out, somebody needs to get there. Otherwise, you're going to have <laughs> frozen pipes, something like that. But 10 below. That's 50. <laughs> 10 below 90 <laughs> <laughs> for you. Yeah. I was going to say, maybe you should think about relocating, but anyways. <laughs> yeah. I haven't thought about that at all. <laughs> Stuff like that. And I think, Ryan, what are you seeing? You work with a lot of different tradesmen and contracting companies. What are, what kind of shifts are you seeing when it comes to what employees are looking for? The employers that are successful, what are they doing? Yeah. It's interesting. The pandemic's really change the way people think about work. We all know that. And I don't want to get too much into that, but yeah. job seekers have options now. They have options. It used to be in the trades, it was really cool. I could go to work. I could be out in the field. I didn't have my boss breathing down my neck. Like a lot of people like that. They don't like that sitting in the office, being micromanaged, all that stuff. The pandemic made it so that a lot of people that a lot of employers that were used to that said, hey, you know what? We can let people work remote. The trades have been doing this forever. Yeah. <laughs> like it's working for them. We can do the same thing. <laughs> and so now we've created these extra options. And when you're the job seeker, you're looking at, wait a minute, do I stay in the trades? Do I go somewhere else? Because now, some of the things I really like about the work I do, I can do elsewhere. And what we're seeing, it's really slow. And this is the unfortunate part. So for those people listening that are open to doing something new, now is the time to do it because you're going to be in the top 2% of employers out there doing it. I don't know what it is about the trades, but it seems like these companies are really slow to move and to shift, like to make these kind of changes. And I know it's all bred out of fear. That's really, and that's a lot of what our coaching is like, why are you acting this way? And they're like, well, I'm scared. Let's talk about what's really going to happen. But I would say the things like PTO is a big one. We're starting to see more people get flexible with paid time off. We're seeing people get more flexible with shift schedules. Like you had said, instead of doing on call, okay, we're just going to stagger some things so that we all know things are covered. Ryan, on that, so flexible yeah. shifts, because this is something I tried. I was, I ran a branch. This was back in 2018. I opened a branch and I love this idea. I don't, I probably heard it on a podcast or somewhere. 
You yeah, probably I, heard I, it on my on I'm probably on your podcast. Yeah, even knowing it was yeah. you back in the day, back in the day. <laughs> But I love, I immediately love the concept. I tried some variations of it. Now, I only had three guys at the time, so it was a little more difficult. Are there some things that people can start preparing for to start turning their company into shifts or conversations they can start having with their employees to see if who's who's open to work, maybe work on a Saturday or something like that? Is there things that you're that we can help facilitate that? Yeah, I think you said it, it's conversations, but... My experience is a lot of these employers, they're just, they're not comfortable with having the conversation. They're like, what if they say something I don't like? Okay, would you rather them quit? So I think having that conversation, but one of the things that I'll warn you about is if you don't have the conversation and you don't really plan for this, you're going to lose people because people don't like change. Period. Doesn't matter if you own the company or if, you're an office manager or a CSR or a field tech. It doesn't matter. People don't like change. So you're saying if you Happen. just do implement it without talking to them, yeah. then there's going to be an issue. Okay. 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 Yeah. I, yeah. I was thinking, okay. Yeah. That, I agree but with that but even talking to them, they may not like it, right? You, you okay. might even talk to them and say, Hey, we're going to make this shift. And they're like, I don't like this, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but at least now you get to have the conversation. Okay. Why don't you like it? Maybe there's a blind spot for me. Maybe I'm not seeing something. Or maybe they don't understand yeah, it's probably more so they don't understand. They're like, I just want to keep doing what I'm doing, but I don't right. understand how this could benefit that employee down the line. How many happy people have you had on your show that have talked about the tech selling from their own pocketbook? Oh, all the time. Yeah, all and the it's, time, it's right? Because so it's the mindset. They don't yeah. understand what goes into all this. They have no idea why it why you charge $150 just to drive the truck there. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, what? It makes no sense to me. So I think having those conversations and talking to them about it and being okay with the fact that it might not be a fit for everybody. Yeah. But, and if you had that conversation, like I have a technician that came on board and one of his things was he needed to take his kids to school Mm. and he needed to be able to take his kids to school in the morning. And instantly I'm thinking, oh, those would be perfect. We can start you off at the at 10 o'clock or that's when your day would start is at 10 o'clock. And it was like, I'm perfectly fine with working late. I have no problem with that. My wife just has to go into work at 6 a.m. And yeah. so th- we don't have anybody to take kids to school. And I'm like, word, perfect. And <laughs> yeah. but then you gotta you come be into summer. that's different for people, right? <clears throat> exactly. hundred percent. But you have to have that conversation. Like you said, if you just assume that, OK, he's late every day and I'm going to fire him. That doesn't make any sense. That's asinine. Let's have a conversation as to why you can't come in early or why you can't be here at eight o'clock in the morning or whatever. Yeah, it's so funny. I have a story I I tell in a lot of my workshops about uh, when I was in corporate, I had this gal transfer to my team because her manager couldn't deal with her anymore. I can't deal with her low performance, such a mess. I'm going to send her to you. You either shape her up or ship her out like you choose. All right. (laughs) I sat down with her. I said, what's the problem? She goes, I'm supposed to be here at eight. I can't make it till 8.30, 8.45 because my kid's school doesn't open till eight. My mm. boss doesn't care. And they just ream me every morning for being late to make an example out of me. And she's like, and it messes up my, it messes me up in the head. And it takes till lunchtime before I'm actually, okay, calm. I can go work now. And then she's got to leave and go pick her kids up at five o'clock. And so I was like, all right, we'll tell you what, your day starts at 8.30. She's you can't do that. He goes, says who? She goes, my old boss. <laughs> and I'm like, no, that's it. Your day starts at 8 She became a number one performer in the entire operations. That's crazy. That's it's crazy how just get removing those tiny barriers will because not only that, you you're working with that person's schedule, they're gonna be that much more grateful to you. Oh, like yeah. with Tersh's example, he they get this, he gets to take care of his kids in the morning have a great morning. He doesn't have to rush. He can mm-hmm. take his time and get ready for work, then come in, then do his job, still feel good about it. It works for his family. His wife's happy. Like you make so many different little things in their life happy. So they don't have to worry about all these little stressful things during their day that are going to cause them to rush through a call, have have the wife calling or the husband calling during the day back and forth because they they have issues because yeah. they constantly have to try to figure out who's picking up the kids, who's dropping them off, all that stuff. It's very stressful <laughs> stuff. So I think the more flexible employers and now can church be has these a guy that can take some later calls. 
Exactly. Yeah. People get home from work and the heat's not on. They're like, Tersh actually, and if any of his employees listen to this, he opened a babysitting service. <laughs> he is actually going to watch your kids for free <laughs> during the day so you guys can make money for the company. <laughs> hey, no joke. We were talking to Danielle Putnam with the new flat rate at the AHR Expo, and she mentioned that the state of Georgia has a tax write-off for paying for daycares. So if you're, as an employee or an employer, if you pay for the daycare for your employees, then you can write off that amount on your taxes. Nice. Yeah, it's a benefit, a win-win for everybody there. I'm not watching here? kids because I don't even like my own kids. <laughs> I definitely don't like your kids, but no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so That's a good point though. Make sure to check with your state. Maybe there is something that, you can help your, it's, it's a great benefit. Like instead of the traditional benefits, something that is unique, that actually helps more than say health insurance when the one time out of every eight years you need it or whatever. Yeah. Brian, are there other, speaking of this stuff, like you obviously work in this every day. What kind of things are you seeing as far as just other things to attract employees with benefits? Remember, it's never about money. This is rule number one. It's never about money. People use money as an excuse. It's easy. It's never about money. People, st all the studies show people don't switch jobs for money. People don't stay with jobs for money. You have to ask, why is that person open to talking to someone else about more money? I just read a stat the other day that says, if you have a solid culture, if the employee is engaged right, in your company, you got a good culture, they're engaged. It takes a minimum of a 20% pay increase for them to be open to looking elsewhere. If they're not engaged, if you don't have a solid culture, it the, people will actually take a pay cut to leave you. Wow. Really? Okay. That's a great point. <clears throat> That's wild. That's do you think so because inflation is so new here? Do you think that's still the case? That could possibly still be the case? Because like I have guys that are coming to me saying, Hey, I don't know what to do do about I, I hear on talk radio about inflation and it's going to blah 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 um we should be asking for pay raises and stuff like that and what do you say to what's your thoughts on because i don't want to lose guys over yeah fear mongering that's going on in the media at the same time asking for a 30 percent pay raise that's yeah. ridiculous so what's your thoughts there long term we have to understand that when we have these inflationary pressures like we do right now, it's going to change the game for us a lot. You're going to have to eventually raise prices so that you can afford to hire and keep decent people so that they can afford to live. And that's just the reality of it. When you look at a lot of hourly employees, especially, maybe not necessarily your techs if they're <coughs> six-figure earners or anything, a lot of them don't own homes. So when rents go up, that impacts their bottom line, everything else. So from an employer's perspective, it is something you should be talking about if you're not talking about it, is how do you keep up with this? Now, you don't have to keep up with it. If every month they come out and they say, oh, it went up 8%, it went up 8%, that doesn't mean you give an 8% raise every time because because the way they track all that isn't what's going to hit your employee. But you do want to be thinking about it and you do want it to be able to adjust. If you, like out here in Phoenix, for example, where I'm at, I go to, a, we eat out a lot. And we go to restaurants, I'm like, I don't remember it being this much last time. I don't remember it being this much last time. Guess what? I still eat there. And <laughs> yeah. so don't be afraid to raise your prices. Like, I think that's a big thing that a lot of people forget is, oh, I can't raise my prices. I'll lose people. The people, the customers that you lose might be the okay ones to let go of. True. And then you can afford to pay your guys more. I realized the price. So we went grocery shopping last <laughs> week. I'm going through the cereal aisle. And a box of cereal, a normal box of cereal is like, three, normally it was like three bucks, three fifty. It was seven dollars. <laughs> and it wasn't even the big box. And I'm like, seven dollars. What, what the hell is going on? Oh, got a cereal a you're eating, but woo. <laughs> Man, that's some gold food. There, I you know. know. I figured it was going to so shed all this extra dollar. weight that I need to get rid of. <laughs> but on the other side, I wanted to say, so I talked a lot about the employers and how they need to be thinking about it. On the other side, I think having the conversation with your employees is good because Tersh, you got a company, you bring a guy in that's making a premium because that's what the market demands right now. Yeah. And this recession that everybody's talking about hits and you got to let go of somebody who you letting go of first. The guy that's the costing me the most, that's the least productive. 
So <laughs> really what it comes down to though, yeah, well, there you go. That's what we all want to do. But my point is that these people leave and if they're going to be making a premium working for someone else, as yeah. soon as that recession hits and someone's got to let go, who's going to be the first one to have a job? And the last thing you want to do is be looking for a job in the middle of it. So educate your team on, hey, I get I can't maybe pay what that guy's paying, but I'm here. I'm loyal. I want you to be loyal the same way. And when things get tough, we'll figure it out versus, okay, now I got too many people and I got to let go of some. So I'm going to let go of the guys I'm paying the most to. Yeah. The, so what do you say? How, like, how do you have the conversation? I know what happened with my guy, but say you have a scenario what I, I went through this year where all winter long, I was bringing a guy along and he was basically training throughout the winter. So he was an overhead expense for me. And then here we come the first week of the hottest part of the year, he puts in a notice and I know he's moving back home to Alabama, but for me, it's, are you serious right now? Like I could have been training someone else all winter long, or I could have been training, bringing on someone who was more productive instead of having someone who constantly had callbacks, but I gave grace to because he was learning. What do you, how do you prevent that? Something like that from happening? I don't think you're going to prevent it all the time. I think that I think you're better off training the people and losing them than Not training. Them and keeping them, right? You've heard yeah. that before. Oh, yeah. Also, there'll be some loyalty there. If he ever moves back, maybe he comes back. There are some opportunities there. But I think when it comes to those situations, you're not going to win them all. But there are some things you can do to prevent them early on. We teach a process called the pullback offer during the interview. And during that process, you sit down and you have all these what if questions you get to ask. You have a conversation about the, oh, that's cool. What if you decide to move? What would happen? Oh, I'm not moving anywhere. My wife's family's here. We're sticking around. Cool. But what if something happened? How would that look? What would that work? How would you come to me and say, hey, boss, we're having some conversations at home. What can yeah. we do? And then at least you're not blindsided by it. Because I think that's what hurts the most. Yeah. You pour into this guy and then he gives you two days notice. And you're like, what the heck? I thought we were building something here. Yeah. Whereas if he would have come to you three months ago and said, hey, boss, I know we've been training all winter. I hate doing this to you. In three months, I'm moving back home. Yeah, You would have made totally different decisions and you would have had a totally different reaction to that. That's true. That's, that is very true. In this particular instance, I knew something was happening because he was going through a separation and she moved back. And I was like, oh, she's gone back. He's, it won't be long before he's gone back as well. And so mentally I knew, but every time I asked a question, it was like, oh yeah, we're good. I'm good. I'm solid. I'm golden. And it was like, let's pretend for a moment that you're not. Yeah. <laughs> What's that look like? And that's what I didn't do. That's where I failed. I didn't continue that conversation on and say, what happened if that th wasn't the case? where would you be at there? That's what I'll definitely do that in the future for sure, because that could have saved me a little bit of anxiety and frustration, um, especially because the following week I was out of town for almost a whole week. And so I was like, Oh my gosh, like it always happens at the worst time. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and it was hot. And the thing you have to remember is the reason it's such a big deal for you is because of the reason. Let's say he came to you and says, hey, boss, I got cancer. I can't work anymore. I got to get better. You'd be like, dude, go get better. Exactly. Exactly. It's the reason why and the fact that we get blindsided that it's such an issue. That's and true. so if we're having more of that conversation and I tell people to have the conversation in the interview, have that conversation. What if in a year you decide, you know, what? I don't like it here anymore. I want to move. And then just have that conversation. If someone asked me that, if I was applying for a job in Phoenix, I'd be like, oh yeah, I'm out of here. It's going to happen. It was 117 on my back porch this last <laughs> This is stupid. For me, I'd be like, oh yeah, I'm already thinking about it. We're already talking about it. Whereas there might be other people like, hey, all my, I just talked to a buddy of mine yesterday. He's like, no, my in-laws are here and they are so close to the kids. They love it. They <laughs> love them. We're never leaving unless we leave together. But what? Tell me this then. What happened? Because we've had that conversation before. Like I try to have, I don't have that conversation, but I have the, hey, what do you want to do in the future conversation? Because I try to pull out of them. Do you want to own your own business? Because if you do, then I want to teach you how to do it properly. I don't want you to become a competitor of mine and then not understand what it is to mess it up business. for everybody. Yeah. yeah. And so 
if that's what you want, then let me know and I'll teach you how to do it. And then you're almost like an apprentice of mine. And then you can go on and do your own business. And every time I've ever gotten that as an honest answer and I've had someone shadow me, they're like, nah, not worth it. I can yeah. make so much yeah. more money being a technician or a salesman or That's something else. Sleep at night. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But then I have other people who are like, no, I want to be a technician forever. I want to be a technician yeah. forever. And then it's after the fact, they're doing side work or they're doing X, Y, and Z. And they're like wanting to get their own business or create their own business. And I'm like, why not just tell me that? And I get it. I understand the fear of, oh, my boss is going to fire me if I tell him that I want to be his competitor. I get that 100%. Right. Do, you, do you think that someone would be honest with you if they said, if you asked, like, what happens if you decided to move in a year or something? What happens if you didn't want to be here and unhappy? Do you not think since they're interviewing, they're putting on their best show? Like they're going to give an honest answer at that exact moment. I think as the interviewer, it's your job or your responsibility to get that out of them. And that's what we talk about in my first book, how to hire the ones you won't want to fire. We talk about all these different interview techniques and ways to get people to basically take their mask off and show up authentically. That's what we really want. We want people to be their authentic selves. We have a client that does, he's an electrical contractor, and he does a similar thing where he brings guys in that want to start their own business. He's like, I want that entrepreneurial mindset. Yeah. And I, you know what? You come work for me for three years. I'll teach you everything. Guess what happens at the end of three years? They're like, There's no, I'm, board. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm sticking around. I'm going to do it your way. And that's it. And well, even just, if they do stick around, they generally will get, because they have that mindset to move things forward and they want to make things better. They generally will give the company a lot of effort. Absolutely. Because they're fully in, because they, it, those are the people that will actually end up doing their own businesses. The ones that really have that drive outside of working hours and like weekends. Those are the ones that will eventually actually own their own business, but they're going to give you in three years, they can make your business awesome. Like and, they can really help you solve a lot of problems. And that's why that culture component we alluded to a little bit earlier in the show is so important because you have to remember that these people are giving up time with their friends and their family and the things they do for fun to come work for you. That's what they do. They, yeah. They're giving that up. And as employers, we often think we're writing them a check. Yeah, but is that really, can you really put a value on the time with your kids or value on time with your hobbies and your family? You can really put a value on that. And it's typically not what we're paying them in wages. So right. we have to offer more than just the pay. And this is where values, purpose, and vision come into. Values are, th that's how we make decisions. That's how we choose to live. It's basically the rules, like our moral code. Like we don't violate these things. These are so important to us. Purpose is what gets people out of bed in the morning. Whether it's they want to make a difference, they want to impact the community, they want to serve people. That's purpose. That's what gets them out of bed in the morning. But what keeps them on the bus is, the vision of the company. Where are we going? And I think that's what we're really talking about here is this vision component. Because when we sit down with a new candidate and we're talking to them, most people are thinking, how do I pay rent this weekend? I'm either unemployed or I'm looking for a new job. How do I pay rent this weekend? They're not thinking a year, two years, five years down the road like True. entrepreneurs do. They're just not. And so when we sit down at that conversation, they've never been asked those questions before. Just go into it knowing that they've never been asked this. So when they come back and they're like, I've never really thought about that. I don't have an answer. Yep, that sounds good. It's our job to say, well, let's work on this a little bit. Let me invest in you for 20 minutes during yeah. the interview. And let's have this conversation of the vision you want for your life. Hmm. Because here's where we're going as a company. This is the company's vision. The destination, I don't know if I mentioned on the last show, but Jim Collins, good to great, getting the right people on the bus. Like, where's this bus going? And do you want to go where this bus is going? And the bus right. is the company in this analogy here. If you're saying, hey, we're going here and I, I want to make entrepreneurs and I want to basically grow, like home grow my future competition. If that's my vision for the company and that's what we're doing is building a system and organization where we take techs and we teach them how to become their own 
companies. For people that don't align to that, they're like, no, I just want to be a tech forever. Great, you can do that here, but our vision is we're going to be growing our competition. We're going to take over the whole community. And maybe it doesn't mean you become a competitor. Maybe you become a branch manager, or maybe you become a service manager, or maybe you become a field manager. Like you all of a sudden are getting more of an equitable position inside the company versus becoming my competition. If that's the vision you have for your company, you're going to hire a completely different type of person than the one who says, hey, my vision is to put food on the table by the end of the week and pay the pay rent at the end of the month, which is how you, employers are thinking right now. Oh, yeah. But do you still hire those people who are looking to get rent paid by the end of the month or end of the week or whatever? If you like high turnover, you bet. OK, yeah, what if that's the only people that are applying. Like, what if you're what if you're getting a challenge of not getting people to apply who have the vision of becoming their own boss or whatever. That's a mar that's a communications and a marketing issue. Okay. But remember the important piece here is that needs to be the vision of the company. So if your vision is to grow entrepreneurs, your future competitors, you put that out there and you live by that and you make decisions around that. If your vision, which for a lot of people in the trades right now is how do I pay rent at the end of the month or how do I make payroll this week? Yeah. If that's their vision, if that's their limited vision, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. If that's the kind of company you want to build where it's month to month, we'll figure it out. And for some entrepreneurs that works. Just realize that the technicians that you're gonna attract with that kind of vision are different than the kind of technicians you're gonna attract with the other one. That's a good point. Yeah, that's a great, that's point. A great point. Ryan, I know we're running up on time here. I did wanna like briefly touch again on <laughs> applicant tracking systems. Yeah. Uh, and maybe we'll have to do another segment where we, that's all we focus <laughs> on, like how to operate that. But can you just go over again the just what it is, how it helps, and maybe anything else that you can add that you've seen help other contractors. Yeah. I, I want to start by saying an applicant tracking system is just like any other piece of software in your business. It's only going to work as well as you work the tool. Mm -hmm. right? So I always use the analogy of the hammer and you'll give a hammer to my five-year-old and it costs me a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Give a hammer to a master carpenter and it makes a lot of money. It's still the same exactly. tool. Yep. ATS is the exact same thing. It's the same tool. And I get asked a lot, what's the best one? I say the same thing every time. The best one is the one your company uses. <laughs> uh, I just got access to a client's ATS and I'm like, this thing is so lacking of features. It doesn't, they're like, yeah, but we love it. We know how to use it. It works for us. I'm like, it's the best one out there then. Yeah. <laughs> for me, because I know what these things can do and this one can't do it. But if, it, if you use it and it's getting you results, awesome. So I say that to say the best one. We have a couple we recommend for people that go through our coaching program, our training program, but we help them find the right one. And it's not always one of those couple. But I would say the thing that they, there's two things that an ATS really does that is a game changer. Number one is it allows you to post your jobs in one place in the ATS. And then the ATS distributes it to the job boards for you. So instead of going to Indeed and posting a job and going to Career Builder and going to Craigslist and going to Monster and going to ZipRecruiter and doing all and going to LinkedIn and posting them there, instead of doing those all manually, you post it one time in the ATS and the ATS sends it out to all of them. <clears throat> Great. Does it does that information come back to ATS so you can reply? Yep. Through there. So you don't have to go through Indeed replying. Correct. That is a nuisance, man. I'll get it sometimes on my phone or on my desktop and it's always in a different place and man it takes me 15 minutes and you always get the where. indeed email address that's not the real email address so you don't really yeah. know how to email the guy yeah so that's the second thing it does actually so the first one it pushes all the information out to the job boards the second one it brings all your applications into one place so that you can manage them from one place and not just you manage them, but your team can manage them. Like I know a lot of people are like, no, we set up a Excel sheet on the shared drive. So we all have the same information, <laughs> right? Or when we schedule one, we have to make sure we invite all the right people. Well, these ATSs are set up so that they can actually schedule themselves. The job seekers can schedule themselves and puts it on everybody's calendar automatically. Uh. These applicant tracking systems are set up so that when an application comes in, they automatically get an email that says, hey, thanks for applying. We're reviewing your application right now. If you want to expedite things, here's our number to call us. Now you can see who the go-getters are. When you decide you want to talk to the person, you can just you literally just drag and drop to the next stage, just like a CRM would be. And it sends out an email or a text message even. These are doing text messages now. 
sends out a text message says, hey, we really like your application. We would love to talk to you. Here's a link to schedule a time to talk. And mm. they get to do all of that. There's one system out there. It's not the best system for everybody. So I usually don't talk about it a lot, but <laughs> for the right employer, it makes sense. We have a couple of clients that are going from application. So the time the application comes in all the way to scheduling the in-person interview, completely hands off. The system mm. takes care of everything. Even sending a text message that says, hey, we sent you an email yesterday to schedule. We haven't heard from you. Oh, yeah. That automated I like that. process. I like it's that. Cool. <laughs> it's cool. But that's a system that's not for you. got to be a tech savvy yeah, so say, you got to know how to set up the triggers and the automations and yeah. stuff like that for that to happen, right? Somebody on your team's got to be a techie and really into that. Most of the people we set up, we help them set it up in our program. We help them set that up. And then nine months later, we'll be like, how's it going? They're like, we haven't changed a thing. But it's, working. <laughs> it's like I said, it's not for everybody, but that's one of the systems. But most of the good systems these days mm -hmm. are doing uh, text messaging, which is really helpful for people in the field because you got to remember your texts are not sitting behind a computer all day right so they're not checking emails all day that's not exactly. what they do but a text message comes in they're on it that's how do we how, how does someone join that program that you mentioned which one i don't know the one that You're, you did you talked about setting up the ats oh so that's our coaching and training program okay so, how did, so what we do is we work with the employer for 90 days and we train them on our entire process, the core fit hiring system. And we teach them everything from how do you develop your culture, your core values, your vision, your purpose. We do that with them. So it's not just training. We're walking through that with them. How do you find the right people? I always talk about if you go to Lake Indeed with your rod and reel and go fishing, yeah, overfished. And the fish that are left aren't the ones you want to take home. <laughs> True. So we need to find a different lake to go fishing from. So we talk about that from marketing ac activities, like how do you identify who the right people are and where they are? And then we move into automation. Because what I've learned is that if I can automate this, just by automating it, I can get you better results. Yeah. If you do nothing else but You're speaking our language now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we have one client went and I asked him, I said, so how are things going? And they go, we're getting about the same number of applicants that we used to get before we met you. I'm like, oh really? Yeah, but we're not spending 600 bucks a week on applicant on Indeed anymore. Like that all went away. The 600 bucks a week went away. I said, anything else? They're like, we're spend 20 hours less a week processing applications. Whew. Yeah. So that's so I'll take more. the same number of applications, but save 20 hours a week. All yeah. day. And then finally we dig deep into this interview process. How do you have these conversations? Like I talked about the pullback offer and the what ifs and these scenarios guide them through how do you have this interview conversation versus mm -hmm. we just had a coaching client the other day and he's oh yeah we have a conversation i go really let's role play it real quick it was like a three minute monologue i'm like let me define conversation so uh, how do we how do we get more information on that easiest way is go to my website top mm -hmm. of my website there's a banner that says register for my free we do training in that so you get a sense of what our how our training works but then we also talk a little bit about our program okay cool so. So. By far the best way to do that. But, and we dig into vision and values and purpose and these what if scenarios, all this stuff. It's, I enjoy it. I geek out about it, but it's yeah. incredibly valuable. And I would say the clients that come in and do the work, the results they get are, some of them are just silly, like you, almost hard to believe. Okay, cool. But, but it's all about doing the work. <laughs> yeah. You, it's all useless if you don't actually put it into practice. So. I tell people all the time, I can't wait for the day that a personal trainer is going to charge me a hundred bucks an hour to eat broccoli and hit the treadmill for me. And I lose weight. <laughs> exactly. That, I, Sign whoa, me up. Figures Sign out, me. I'm in. But that's what we do when it comes to looking for people. Yeah. We think we can outsource the solution, but you can't. Exactly. Ryan, man, we appreciate you being here and sharing everything with us as always. You, hey, real quick. Can you drop the name of your book? You mentioned it earlier, but it was said quick. Can you drop the name of that again, just in case anyone wants to read yeah. that? How to hire the ones you won't want to fire. I like that. And for people that want a free download of it, you can get it from my website uh, or you can get it on Amazon, booksellers, anywhere else. It's a short read too. It's only 60 pages. I know who awesome. my target market is. They don't like to read long books. <laughs> Dersh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't mind reading. I have long books. I, uh, I like listening to long books. This yeah. one's not on audiobook, but my, my next book will be on audiobook. So sweet. Gotcha. Ryan, I appreciate it, man. This was great information. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I really enjoy it. 
I was just reading a comment from Facebook. I'm going to throw this up there really fast right before we end the show. And I don't know who it is that said it. Share your thoughts on that real fast. I absolutely agree. The thing is, when this is why values alignment is so important. We talk a lot about values alignment. Their core values, the employee's core values, don't have to necessarily be your core values. Like the yeah, deep no, 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 agree, top values yeah. don't have to be there, but they have to align. Yep. Like one of our core values is always improving. We are always asking people for feedback. How do we do this better? How do we get you more value? I, that came from me because that's one of my core values. But oh, I don't expect that my team has the same deep seated sense of I've always got to be improving, reading books, listening to podcasts. But when I do say, hey, I'm sending you to training because I want to improve what you're doing, yep. then they're open to it. We have a client right now that they don't have the core value of always improving, but one of theirs is we're better because we can be. Like that's just it. And they're actually launching, is it Simple Dollar? Dave Ramsey's course? He's, got a, he's got a few of them. Yeah. And offering it to all of their employees. To mm. better improve themselves. Yeah. To better improve themselves. I love that. Because they're like, if, if our people are better at home, they'll mm -hmm. be better at work. That's true. Cool, man. We appreciate it. I yeah. know we're at the end of our time. No uh, thank you again, Ryan, for everything. Thank you, guys. Brian. I definitely, if anybody has any questions, I'll put every, all this information in the show notes and definitely reach out to Ryan. Go to the visit thecorematters.com and sign up for his free, free training course. But yeah, with that being said, I hope you have a wonderful and safe week until we talk again next time. See you guys. Are you looking for valuable business advice to reach that seven-figure revenue mark? Do you want actionable tips to properly navigate through every business challenge you encounter along the way? Let Tersh Blissett and Josh Crouch be your guide in getting you to the top here at Service Business Mastery. Tune in as they sit down with world-renowned authors in business, leadership, and personal growth who share valuable insights about management, marketing, pricing, human resources, and so much more. Let their nuggets of wisdom gold guide you in owning a thriving, profitable, and ever-growing business. Here are your hosts, Tersh and Josh.